Welcome to the Continuing Winemaker Series here at the Wine of the Month Club. And man, we had a great surprise. We have Napa royalty here. It's Robert Sinsky from Sinsky Vineyards. Is that the first name I've been called that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, probably one of the first wineries I ever visited uh, after being involved with my father was, was Sinsky Vineyards. And I can't, if I remember when I went into the place, it wasn't more than a month or two old. And it was right. in the late 80s. Right. So you've been up, up there since... Since I moved up there in 87, helped get the winery launched. And uh, I was supposed to be there for six months, and I think I lived out of that original suitcase for the first six years. Oh, boy. Well, and, you, th and this wasn't what you had intended to do, right? This no. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. I thought I was going to achieve fame and fortune behind a camera. And uh, I was working my way into the advertising world and in journalism, doing celebrity portraits, that type of thing. Which is a pretty tough racket, right? It is. It is. That's why, you know, you know, hustling, hustling that every day, you always have a certain amount of insecurity. Right. And so I thought I'd get into something more insecure. Of yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, especially in the late... Well, I don't know. California was sort of coming around, but... Um, you said that you went to Pasadena Arts Center, which is a very famous art school. Well, it's the Arts Center, the then I transferred over to the Arts Center, or, or um, uh, Parsons School of Design in New York. So then, they to have wine classes there or something, or...? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you always have to get a date. Yeah, right. <laughs> why, why else? <laughs> as far as that goes. So he came back, and your dad called, and he said, hey, I need some help doing this thing. And Exactly, exactly. He just said, come on up, uh, work with my people, um, you know, hire a management staff to run the winery for me, wow. and then go back to your world. And um, about you know, two weeks into it, I realized that this was everything my life has being geared towards. Oh, I, that's just, great. I just didn't know it. That's great. Mm -hmm. So back then, so you're talking, you know, California wine, the 70s, when my dad's store started in, in the, when my dad bought it in the late 60s, still in the 70s, we had Chateau Montalena, Bob Barrett, I mean, uh, Bill, uh, Jim Barrett lived near us. It was still, you know, just a very cottage industry. And so mm -hmm. even in the late 80s, it probably was still. No, it was still, you know, Bob and Davi would come over and give us advice. And, really? You know, you know if, you needed, if you needed something from anybody, they were there. They were there to help out. I remember uh, Bob Picota, you know, sitting next to me on the tour bus as we'd run around with the Vintners That's Association. Amazing. And he would he would give me advice. Uh, the folks from from Silver Oak would give me advice. It was it was just really uh, That's amazing. Uh, a, a lot of camaraderie. What a great, great history. And, and mm -hmm. so to establish a team back then mm -hmm. that was your task to do, couldn't right. have been that easy to find. No, no especially since I didn't have a clue what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, That'd be one reason why it would be difficult, right? <laughs> right, but uh, uh, Joe Cafaro uh, came on board as our first winemaker. And Joe, um, uh, you know, at the time was making wine at, at Acacia. And uh, Acacia sold to the Shalom Group. Right, he, yeah, he, needed, right. he needed new employment, so he came on board. Uh, Jeff Vernig came knocking on our construction shed door. And really? Was our, was our wow. first employee other than Joe. And Jeff uh, came on as our cellar rat and became the winemaker in 91, and we've been working together since. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I saw his picture on the, so 30, he's been with you guys 30 years. Basically, almost, yeah. 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 That's amazing. Yep. Great, yep. Great we haven't history. killed each other yet. What do you suggest, the Pinot Gris first? Or the, yeah, uh, let's the Pinot Gris. Which is a really fun grape to see from Napa. We don't see a lot of it. Right, right. What, we, 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 we planted this grape um, initially under contract for another winery uh, because we were growers first before we were winemakers. And um, uh, that winery was making a, a style that kind of fell out of fashion. They were going yeah. through a barrel fermentation, malolactic style of Really? Wow, how interesting. And, yeah, this and, is not that, for not sure. Not at all, <laughs> not at all. And so I was, I was actually very pleased to get this vineyard back. And um, um, we do a whole cluster press, stainless steel ferment. The idea is keep the acidity bright, keep the wine crisp, um, grow it well, and try not to screw it up. Well, that's, that's so like uh, you've done that because this is one of the most complex Pinot Gris I've tasted, and I don't taste a lot from, from the Napa area anyway, but you get the fruit, you know, you, right. get, you get the grape, and that's right. really neat. Right, right. Yeah. You know, our, our overriding philosophy is that wine is not an athletic event, so we don't send wine out for review. Mm. So we make wines that we want to drink, and we have to assume that other people want to drink that, that as that's well. That's great. Well, I'll give it a review because this is the first time in a long time that every wine I tasted with you, I have my own little unique scoring system so that I can remind myself what I thought of the wines, and they all got great ratings because they just really great expressions of what they're supposed to be. Well, thank you. And that's kind of like our job here is to show people wines that are supposed to be what they are, mm -hmm. not something else with the drink. Right, right, right. But this is a wonderful example. I love the crisp. Even the nose is crisp, you know, it's just great. Mm -hmm. 
No, it's it's, it's um, you know for a, for a Pinot Gris um, from California, it's only 13.1 alcohol, so it just barely broke barely, the 13 right. mark where you see most of them up up over the 14. Um, so is this an early ripen ripening grape, or is it? Um, you know, it, it, it's it's not as early ripening as say uh, Gewurz, but it comes in um, in, the, in that second wave. And this is. Uh, so this, this is, is Abraxas. And this is a Sonoma wine now. So this is right, something. This is our Centia Sonoma vineyard. So it's still Carneros. Um, uh, we acquired this piece of land um, uh, just over the, the county line. I need a, need a passport to get over there. Yeah, of course. But um, uh, uh, the, the, the concept behind this wine was to create a vin de terroir of four, four classic grapes and get away from the heavy, heavy manipulation that you see in a lot of wineries. Um, we, didn't, we didn't want a technological seller. We wanted to work with the vineyard. And, and the idea here is that each has its own ripening cycle, each responds distinctly to the vintage, and then after we bring in the fruit, then we think about the blend. And some years it has been Pinot Gris based, some years it has been Pinot Blanc based. This year it's, it's a Riesling, Riesling Pinot Blanc base. And, um, and the idea is crisp, floral, cuisine oriented, a wine that uh, sneaks up on you. You don't, you don't realize it on the first taste and then it just keeps giving you more and more. You said you had it with seafood of the night, which I can see exactly. Uh, but you know, since you have Riesling, you, have, you still have fourteen percent Gewürztraminer in there, yeah. which, which both Riesling and Gewürztraminer can dominate a, a wine like this if you let them. And, and clearly, and this is what the comment I made earlier was that the balance of the of the flavors of all the grapes is so great. I would be, I can pick out, you can pick it out, but you're not dominated by it. I, right. It's a great, right. great balance you put uh, together. Again, it was it was uh, to try and be as seamless as possible where, where in, the, in this particular incarnation, the Riesling is the front of the mouth. The Pinot Gris is the mid palate. You get that, that um, pear and almond mm -hmm. notes from that. And then the um, uh, Gewurz is that bit of spice in the finish. Kind of wraps of, it all up. Yep. Really good. That's a really fun wine. So Braxis is a is not necessarily a different brand. It's just the name of a wine. Right. Region. Right. Abraxas is is named after the um, the Egyptian Gnostic god of the three hundred and sixty five heavens. Wow. And, um, Who did yeah. that research? <laughs> <laughs> this is what I do late at night. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my wife thinks I'm doing porn, and I'm I'm actually figuring out what Abraxas means. But um, um, but in, in Greek lettering, it's also three hundred sixty five. So the whole idea is Abraxas is made up up by the vintage, and we just try and let the vintage define it. Let's, let's give that a rest. Yes. Pinot. This is this is now this, this is, is a it. signature Sinsky. Yep. And I remember yep. the Pinots from the eighties tasting up there. Right, right. Well when my when my father uh, decided to become a grape grower, um, he he had a unique vision about food and wine and he believed that the American diet would be evolving, we'd be embracing cuisine from not necessarily wine cultures, we'd be embracing a lighter, healthier cuisine mm -hmm. and believed that Pinot Noir was the grape of the future. You know, and, and um, um, he was determined, and th this is back in the 60s when he was talking about this, and, and there was no market for Pinot Noir at the time. Yeah. So when he started planting vineyards in the 80s, um, Pinot Noir was getting $300 a ton, which is hard to believe. Um, you, know, you know, just for perspective, Chardonnay was getting about between nine and $1,100 right. a ton in, <laughs> so. in that day. So it made no economic sense whatsoever to plant Pinot Noir, but he was determined to do it. And I am very thankful that he did. Because uh, they're we, great wines. Thank you. The spice component's amazing. And you're right, because when I stocked my dad's shelves in the 70s, early 70s, it was so common to see 100% Cabernet. Right. They wanted to make sure that everybody knew it was Cabernet, and it was 100% Cabernet, and that we had very few Pinot Noirs, I remember, stocking the shelves. Yeah. This is, the complexity of this wine is so interesting. Well, thank you. And one of the longer finishes I've had. Right. Well, one, one, one of the fortunate things that I inherited in this whole process is the heirloom. Um, the the uh, clones that were, I, I can't even call them clones, they're field selections. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be li very late ripening. So you're able to, you know, they, they, they sugar up much later and they sugar up more in sync with the physio physiological ripeness. So you can pick at a, at a lower bricks and have that full development of flavor. Uh, these are probably, we probably started picking at about 22 and a half, which is more common practice these days to start picking about 24, 25. As I say, it's a little, a little light on the sugar that way. Right, right, but but it's not lacking at all in no, flavor. No, not at all. Yeah, not at all. The the wonderful is extraction all. as well. It still gets plenty. Mm -hmm. And so how many different Pinots do you have there? Uh, we make six different Pinot Noirs. Um, oh, over the last couple of years, we are in very short supply of Pinot Noir because the yields were so tiny. 
we actually in, in, in uh, 2010 and 2011, we actually had some vine rows with, with nothing on them because the rain occurred wow. during flowering. How tragic. Yep. Yep. That's, that's farming. I had a, uh, I'm Armenian descent and somebody came in, I haven't had her on camera yet, but she, they spent $20 million on a winery. Their first vintage was supposed to be 2011, all indigenous Armenian grapes, which aren't that interesting, but the whole crop, all of it wiped out by hail. Lost the whole thing. I can't imagine. <laughs> so, so this is uh, Bordeaux varietals. Right, right. This also is Carneros, but it is, um, we, we consider this the right bank of Napa. So it, it is hillside Carneros. Mm. Um, it is a clay loam soil. Um, you have a heat summation very similar to Santa Mayo. And years ago, um, back in the, again in the 80s, I was short of Merlot one year. And so I went to Tony Truchard and I asked him if I could buy 10 tons of his Merlot, and he would only sell me 10 tons if I would buy three tons of Cabernet Franc. So he, there was no market for Cabernet Franc That's in those funny. days. <laughs> That's funny. Great uh, negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> right, but I, um, I absolutely fell in love with the Franc on his property. Gorgeous. And I ended up uh, uh, planting Franc on the hillside across from him, and this is from our Vandal Vineyard. And this idea of a ripe bank wine started back then, but people weren't quite ready for that. They still wanted Merlot. Right. They wanted 100% yeah. varietal wines. So the POV is our, is our wine with a point of view. Uh, um, it, is, it is. I guess our time's up. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to blow. I forgot it does that. We, we, got, we still it's got gonna four minutes. It's going to blow. <laughs> um, uh, but, but, but the whole idea, again, was to work with Cabernet Franc, Merlot, a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon, create a wine that was much more elegant than your typical Napa Cap. It's yeah. gorgeous, and the balance is great, and, and you have one more pass, it's the Marcian, which is, the, you're currently pouring the 08. Right. But this has wonderful legs, uh, length to it, too, as well. I mean, it's got yeah, enough it's, acid it's to carry a, it. It's not a, um, you, know, you know, to steal another winery slogan. It's, yeah. not, a, it's not a wimpy wine, but, no. it, but it's elegant. It yeah. has acid. Gorgeous. It has structure. And it is phenomenal at the table. And I love the franc nose. You get that, mm -hmm. that little greenness. It's really good. Yep. Well, it's such a pleasure having you here, Robert. And, uh, well, thank you. I, 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 I can say good luck, but I don't think that's really necessary. <laughs> but it's just wonderful to taste your wines again. It's been really 20-something years since I've seen the label here, and I, it's great to have you here. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you.